explore over the next 40 minutes is really the, the physical legacy of the Bridgewater Canal in terms of later Victorian transport systems, particularly the railways, but also the impact on the creation of the Bridgewater Canal of earlier transport systems, in particular the turnpikes. And I hope that in, at the end of the 40 minutes we'll be able to see that the Bridgewater Canal was not just the world's first industrial canal, but actually a pivotal moment in the transport and communications system. And the idea of rapid communications, I know it might seem bizarre to say canal travel is rapid, but the idea of rapid communications is a concept that's actually been embedded in our industrialising society for 250 years and, and the current um, development of communications uh, in the digital sphere is just another version of that ever-growing speed. Now, I'm going to have a shameless plug here. Um, Martin very kindly mentioned the work of the centre uh, and the uh, work uh, we've been doing with Nigel and to get this conference going, and there will be a publication from this conference next year and we'll, Nigel um, and I will talk a bit about that at the end of the day. But we had a conference on the Bridgewater Canal in October and this is the, we have a publication coming out later this month on the Bridgewater Canal which is not the conference publication but actually a series of papers on the recent work on the Bridgewater Canal over the last 20 years. And the reason I put it up, apart from being a shameless plug, please look out on Amazon and the university's website for when it's launched. The re real reason I put it up is because we're actually going to be publishing this in two formats. We're going to be publishing this in the traditional paper format, just as the book you have on the Bridgewater Canal in your packs. And we're also going to be publishing this as an e-book to download through the ether over the fibre optic network from a digital um, in a digital form and I have test driven this, my wife has test driven this on her Kindle, my daughter has test driven this on her touch iPhone uh, and it works. So we're, uh, <laughs> uh, I, sh I shall just leave it on my laptop and as a, as a paper version but this is a, uh, a new venture for us and I think it's quite, quite appropriate in this archaeology communications conference that we're ab I'm able to sort of say that we're, we're going to be bringing this out in multimedia forms. But of course the thing that will last in the future is probably not the digital copy, it'll be the paper copy, um, <laughs> 400 of them. So, so there we are, we had that dichotomy Martin mentioned before which is how much of this digital uh, 21st century communication network we're developing, how much of that is going to leave a physical archaeological presence in the future. Again I hope that's something we can pick up at the end of the day. So advert break over. Now, the, it, we're, we're still celebrating the 250th anniversary of the opening of the Bridgewater Canal and the Bridgewater Canal led to a boom in building a new transport network around inland waterways that were not attached to the existing uh, river navigation and uh, river system. It, it's very easy as an archaeologist just to be concentrating on one particular type of archaeology and indeed one particular uh, bit of that archaeology. So it's been fascinating over the last 12 months to look at the recent work on the Bridgewater Canal. But there is a wider context to this. That's what I want to explore a bit um, this morning. One of that wider context is is that the Bridgewater Canal didn't just drop out of the ether ready form. It has a history uh, in canal technology that actually goes back to the ancient Egyptians and uh, the Romans in this country and things like the locks and the bypass systems that are central to the development of the canal system in Britain are actually inventions elsewhere in Europe. The Italians for instance were uh, perfected a lock system uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries and the French actually built the first long distance canal, the Canal du Midi, in the mid 17th century. The genius of the Bridgewater Canal, and indeed of the Duke of Bridgewater, was to bring that technology together with two very clever engineers uh, to develop a linear system to, for transporting coal that was not dedicated to following just a river. So that's, that's really a combination of technology which then is 
put together in a new way. There was a precedent for the transport network, though, developing rapidly before the Bridgewater Canal had its act passed in 1759. That is the turnpike system. And turnpikes, the legacy of the turnpikes is important for the development of the canal network because of some of the engineering features on the turnpike system. Uh, you can see here two maps. One on the, the one on the left is the turnpike system in 1750, the other in 1770. You may have heard of the concept of canal mania in the 1790s and railway mania in the 1840s when lots of investors piled in to put money behind all sorts of schemes for canals and railways, some of them viable, some of them not. Uh, more recently, you might remember the dot-com mania of the late 1990s. We had these periodically, these investment bubbles. Well, we had one in the mid-18th century for building turnpike roads. And uh, you can see that by 1770, 15,000 miles of turnpike roads had been built, most of that in the previous 20 years. Now, the way turnpikes were built are very important. They needed an Act of Parliament because that allowed uh, a company to be set up and investment and loans to be raised. That's exactly how the canal system and indeed the railway system would be financed in the later 18th and into the mid-19th century. The turnpike uh, system also involved some heavy engineering. Despite the fact that the average length of turnpike at the beginning of the 19th century was six miles, so you paid your toll to go on six miles, and if you were a coach running from Manchester to London, which would take about three and a half days at the end of the 18th century, you might go through dozens of these. Um, this is significant engineering experience that's being gained. And what you can see here, actually, is uh, that little spidery diagram is the carrier network uh, between Manchester and Chester, recovered from trade directories of the 1770s and 1780s that developed along the turnpike system. So you can see quite a developed uh, regional transport network. And each region in the British Isles develops its own, in its own way. Uh, but more importantly, the map there is the... Uh, is, is actually a whole series of turnpike roads, bypasses and widening of turnpike roads over Castleshaw Moor in the Pennines above Oldham for the textile trade between Lancashire and Yorkshire. And those were built in the late 18th and into the very early 19th century. And you can see how turnpikes could develop and alter quite heavily the existing landscape. So there's a precedence in terms of the way the canals were financed, which we can take back into the turnpike era, and the way in which some of these engineering features were carried over into the canals. And by that I mean in particular terracing and embankment, and to a minor degree, the building of um, bridges. You can see here, uh, this is over the River Etherow near Mosley uh, in the Longdendale Valley. We've got a railway bridge in the background, and then at the bottom there you can see a stone 18th century turnpike bridge and then a bit down the road there's a, a toll booth. So the idea of paying to go on a purpose-built transport network which has cuttings, embankments and bridges was already well established by the time the Duke of Bridgewater came up with the idea in the late 1750s for a canal. Indeed the Duke of Bridgewater had been on the grand tour of Europe. He was aware, he'd actually sailed down the Canal du Midi in southern France. So he was aware of the, aware of the impact of transport networks, whether they be turnpikes or the Bridgewater, uh, or the uh, canal system. It is, there is a strand of history that uh, deals in personalities and heroic figures. On the whole, most heroic figures have their flaws. And in archaeology, we tend to shy away from individual personalities looking at the, the wider um, trends in the data simply because a lot of the information we have is so, is so broad brushed that it's very difficult to be precise about who uh, did what and when. But there are occasions, particularly in industrial archaeology, where we have the ability to use a wide variety of information and new, f new sources of information for archaeologists, the, the written record, the photographic record, the drawn record, sometimes the oral record, where we can see individuals as, as, as um, pivotal in the story. And certainly the Duke of Bridgewater is, because 
His experience and his money and his influence allowed the Bridgewater Canal to be built and allowed the Bridgewater Canal to demonstrate the viability of an inland waterway that was separate from the existing uh, river system and river navigation system. You can see here from the map on the right hand side the canal network as it developed in the early into the early 19th century and it's, it's worth emphasising that canals were being built in Britain down to the 1830s, um, even after the first passenger railway was opened um, in 1830 between Liverpool and Manchester. Uh, canal projects still uh, went ahead. Um, not so many uh, mileage as the turnpikes. We've got 4,000 miles here. Uh, and in the early 19th century, that's 30 million tonnes of good, worth of goods are going on on those networks. And to be more parochial, about 550 miles of canals in the northwest. We're very lucky in Salford in that we, um, both the city's museum and art gallery and the university, Salford University, hold about two, between them, two thirds of the archive for the Duke of Bridgewater's estate, which includes the material for the Bridgewater Canal. Amongst that, there's uh, the written record. We have a whole host of images, contemporary images, and business records, including these wonderful um, maps here. Uh, Worsley Basin from 1786, the map of the canal as proposed in 1765. And we can also follow the notes of uh, John Gilbert, who was um, the Duke of Bridgewater's estate manager, and James Brindley, who was the noted water and corn mill engineer and then becomes associated with canal design, in their own handwriting in those archives. So this is a case where, we, where the archaeology moves seamlessly into the history and, and balancing both approaches in studying the Bridgewater Canal uh, is rather interesting because of the overwhelming amount of data. The Bridgewater Canal itself is almost 40 miles long. The initial route runs from the mines, coal mines at Worsley through to the Castlefield Canal <laughs> Basin over the Barton Aqueduct, which runs over the uh, River Irwell. And then there's an extension uh, granted by Parliament in 1762 through to the Runcorn Terminus. And actually, if you walk the Bridgewater Canal, um, can't do it all in a day, but you can walk it in sections. Um, there are key points on the canal. There's the Worsley Terminus, there's the Castlefield Terminus, and the Runcord Terminus, and then in between there are a whole host of keys. This is one big <laughs> communication system. What's being communicated here uh, is trade, and the idea of trade and making money and moving goods around at a faster rate. There are some gems, as you would expect, in terms of the industrial archaeology along the route. The Worsley um, Canal Basin, the terminus, is one of the most under-investigated industrial uh, transport monuments in the whole of Britain. If you know Worsley, you'll know Worsley Green as a very pleasant um, commuter suburb for Salford and Manchester. It's very difficult to envisage Worsley as the hive of, the, hive of industry with nail makers, carpenters, uh, boat builders, um, as Britain's first inland canal port. There are still some remains left. The granary, which was converted into, the, into apartments in the 1990s, and two of the four surviving dry docks, which I'm glad to stay, say still function uh, in the way they did in the 1760s. There has been some recent uh, excavation at Worsley as well. For the first time, we've started digging holes in the ground at, at Worsley that are not coal-related. Um, this is a very nice view at the bottom there from uh, Nats, Jean-Claude Jean Nats, who in 1806 walked the canal from Worsley to Manchester, sketching as he went. And his, his sketch there is of the lime kilns in 1806. And recently we were able to excavate those lime kilns. There were, there were two pots, two, two shafts for the lime. And you can see the, the circular orbit of one there. And they were backfilled with the remains of boats. So we actually have ironwork relating to the uh, boat fleet, the canal barges along the Bridgewater Canal. What's intriguing about this site is that this, we know, is functioning by 1765 because the Duke of Bridgewater used his own estate resources to... Uh, there's actually a small outcrop of limestone um, it, on the estate which he used to create lime, to create mortar, 
for the construction of the canal itself and lime was also used as a fertiliser on the Worsley uh, estate. He also had his own uh, brick makers and he also used his own estate workers as what we would call now the navvies for building of at least that initial stretch of canal from Worsley to Manchester. So this is a, a very real sidelight onto how that how the canal itself was built. More than that, we could actually look at some of the boats that actually transported the goods on the canal itself. Um, we, if you think of the canal as uh, the equivalent of the fibre optic cable today, then what's the data going in that fibre optic cable? What's going on the canal? Well, it's the goods in the canal boats. And about 20 years ago, uh, when the Boothstown Basin was being drained and converted into a marina surrounded by riverside apartments, we were fortunate enough to come across more than 20 barges um, from the Bridgewater fleet, which had been scuttled uh, probably just before the Second World War. And you can see these during recording. And we were able to plan these and identify three types of boat on uh, the canal. We've got two coal boats, um, which you see at the top, the two narrow boats. Uh, one just a sort of narrow, long, thin uh, structure, the other with separate compartments, square compartments, in which a coal in boxes will be put directly in the uh, collieries. And the third one at the bottom, a wide, flat bottom boat, which is based on the Mersey Flat. That was designed to sail across the River Mersey from the Runcorn Terminus to the Duke's Dock at Liverpool. And that system was up and running by 1773. So we are actually have encapsulated uh, at the Boothstown Basin the remains of the transportation system that the canal was built for. And I think that's very important because quite often archaeologists tend to ignore the, uh, the, the canal boats going along the system and leaving the study to uh, canal historians, social historians. So this, is a, a, a ch this was a chance to record a group of 20 such boats in quite a lot of detail. Along the uh, extension of the canal to Runcorn, which was uh, granted uh, a parliamentary act in 1762, there are still a number of key uh, industrial features, all about water management. One of these is the 1760s overflow where at Cornbrook, which these days, if you take the tram from Altrincham to Manchester, you will drive over in the, in the tram. But down below, we've got this um, apron of stone, which takes the overflow from the Bridgewater Canal and dumps it into the Cornbrook itself. Almost certainly this is designed, well we know it is designed and built by uh, Brindley and we actually recently came across some account records which mentions the list of navvies uh, who are working on constructing this particular structure. So we can now actually start to put names to the people who built it. In the late 1990s the Manchester Region Industrial Archaeology Society actually took the opportunity of some clearance by groundwork in this area clearance of shrubbery, to go in and record this in detail. And apart from the shaded bit in the centre by the circular siphon there, which is an area of concrete which has been patched in the mid-20th century, this particular feature survives almost intact. If we move into Castlefield, there was an equivalent overflow to take the excess water from the um, River Medlock, which was used to feed this end of the Bridgewater Canal. Unfortunately, that's not really visible today because of the later industrial growth in the 19th and urban growth in the late 20th century. There's a, an awful lot known about the way in which Brindley coped with providing water uh, to this end of the canal using the uh, medlock to provide a source of water that would then uh, keep the canal full uh, on its trip out to uh, Runcorn, about 30 miles down the stream. The recent redevelopment of the basin over the last 10 years has allowed us to look at some of the other features of the canal, including the, um, what you can see here is the canal uh, lockkeeper's cottage and the base of a swing bridge built for Hume Lock in 1838, which provided a link between the Bridgewater and the Mersey and Irwell uh, navigation. It is, in fact, a piece of archaeology of competition between two transport networks in the 1830s, the Mersey and Irwell navigation, the Bridgewater and the Liverpool to Manchester Railway were all competing for traffic 
particularly trade between the two great cities and the company who lost out, the transport network system that lost was actually the Mersey and Irwell. They actually went bankrupt, uh, allowing the Bridgewater Canal to, uh, to buy them out. And really one of the reasons they went bankrupt was because the Mersey and Irwell allowed this particular lock to be built in 1838, which linked the Mersey and Irwell and the Bridgewater Canal and bypassed um, their proposed uh, Manchester and Salford Junction Canal, which didn't open until 18 months later. To us now, it seems like a, a, a mad financial and business decision. Um, but the Bridgewater Canal was highly successful at beating off competition, uh, which is one of the reasons why it remained a viable and profitable canal system, transportation system, despite the advent of the railways, really down until the 1870s, uh, when ultimately it was taken over by the company that would build the Manchester Ship Canal. Castlefield Canal Basin itself is very well known in terms of its history and, and in fact when it was being built uh, in, the late eight, in the mid 18th century it drew the attention of what we might call interested parties from the continent um, or uh, particularly the Russian, the, the Prussian court. Uh, so we have German spies. <laughs> or is that, or is that, ger or is that interested German uh, economists coming over? <laughs> in the 1760s and later on the Russians did it as well um, in the 1780s and 1790s to sketch what's going on so our, fir our earliest plan of the uh, cloverleaf weir which at the Castlefield Ca Canal uh, Basin and indeed the first warehouse there which is the grocer's warehouse which you can see at the bottom there with its two arches comes from a German source and was made round about 1769 1770. Um, one of the frustrations with, with dealing with industrial archaeology is that quite often it deals with standing structures which are so familiar when they are demolished and lost in the landscape quite often we find there are no visual images left of them. That's the case here with the two earliest warehouses. You can see the grocer's warehouse here which dates from about 1770 and a sketch by Jean-Claude Natz from 1806 at the top. That's very well known. That was demolished in, in 1960, partially demolished. Uh, but fortunately, um, Professor Tomlinson of Manchester University, who was the first industrial archaeologist working in the Northwest, probably, um, recorded it. However, next door to it was the Duke's Warehouse, also built about 1770. And there are about, t there's two and a half sketches and photographs of this. The top view has, right on the right-hand corner, a little edge of a warehouse which turns out to be the Duke's warehouse. And um, at the conference we, we did in Worsley on the Bridgewater Canal in October last year, afterwards one of the delegates came up to me and gave me the photograph on the right, which is an unpublished photograph of the um, demolition of the Duke's warehouse in 1915 after it had been burnt down. And there's one more photograph in, the, in uh, Cheatham's Library in the centre of Manchester, which has been recently uncovered, which shows the roof of the warehouse in the distance, in the murky distance, in the late 19th century. So archaeology is one of the ways we can recover the plan form, out, out, um, plan form details and importance of these structures, which were so familiar in the landscape, but for which there is very little visual record. And canal warehouses are one of the legacies of the... Bridgewater Canal because it's those canal warehouses with internal loading and unloading facilities for the canal barges which become common on the canal transportation system into the mid to late 19th century. And you can see here the, from these two maps of the uh, Castlefield Canal Basin, one from 1785 on the left, the other from 1821 on the right, both unpublished, uh, both in the Bridgewater archives held by the uh, Salford City uh, Art Gallery and Museum, how rapidly that uh, canal basin at Castlefield developed. And we might have only two warehouses in the 1770s, but by the 1830s we have seven large-scale warehouses, which indeed, in terms of floor area, we're talking in, of warehouses between 4,000 square metres and 7,000 square metres, they are some of the biggest structures 
in industrial Manchester. And this is one of the things we find on the canal network throughout Britain, in Birmingham, in Gloucester, in Manchester. The canal warehouses, uh, before the arrival of the railways, and in the absence of uh, large-scale textile mills, uh, the canal warehouses are almost certainly some of the biggest structures in those uh, cities and towns, on a scale in sometimes bigger than the dockside warehouses uh, of a similar period. Uh, this is the uh, grossest warehouses reconstructed in the late um, 1980s, with an aerial photograph of it uh, from the 1920s on the right. It's really this warehouse, we think, that sets the pattern for split-level loading and unloading in, uh, inside a building. Not just for canal warehouse design, but later on, as we will see, for railway warehouse design. And you can see at Castlefield, there is a close juxtaposition of the uh, canal archaeology and the railway archaeology, particularly in the aerial photography in the background. And perhaps it's no coincidence when I... Um, get to look at the railways at the end of this talk, that there is an overlap in Castlefield uh, between canal architectural design and railway architectural design in a number of key areas. The Grocer's Warehouse itself is important because we can actually see the development on the ground of that split-level loading and unloading system. So... Um, the warehouse has about three different phases, but the key one is from 1770, which is the black phase on the right. And it has actually two canal arms, the earliest of which is on the left. And the hoisting system was worked by a water-powered um, wheel, which actually came from the canal itself. Actually, it came from the canal via the river uh, Medlock. And that system was found to be intact in 1760. So we have a unique survival. It would be very easy just to focus on the structures along the canal, you know, the buildings. Uh, the lime kiln at Worsley still survives. <coughs> we have, uh, I think, three large-scale canal warehouses surviving in Manchester. And indeed, if you drive uh, or walk along the, uh, beside the canal system of Britain, canal warehouses remain one of the really standout features on that transport network. In, in the northwest alone, we, we have more than 50 canal warehouses that survive uh, sometimes derelict, more often converted into offices or apartments along that system, never as functioning warehouses. But as I've already said, there are other features <coughs> along the canal network, particularly the Bridgewater, which had their antecedents with, uh, particularly with the turnpike system. Embankments are one of those. Um, in turnpike terms in the mid-18th century, you would terrace your turnpike route uh, into a hillside in order to provide a smoother gradient. What well, the Bridgewater Canal did across the wide and deep uh, valley of the River Mersey and then later on the River Bolling, which you see here, was to build a high embankment with an aqueduct just over the river itself. And that's what you can see here uh, at Dunham, between Dunham and Agden, this is the Bolling Aqueduct. Um, this actually breached in 1972 and closed the canal for about 18 months. Um, but I suppose it's a testament to the engineering achievement of this embankment that runs for nearly a mile that it survived more than 200 years intact. And actually over... The, the aqueduct itself is quite small. It only runs for about 40 metres over the river Bolin itself. But intriguingly, all over that aqueduct, there are mason's marks, which you can see in the top right-hand corner. And you can trace those same mason's symbols on the ac stone aqueducts across the river, um, river Mersey, between Stretford and Sale, and also on the Barton Aqueduct, which is the most famous of all the aqueducts in the Bridgewater Canal, um, uh, on, the, on the Worsley to Manchester route. And we now know that there was a small group of masons who were providing the finished um, ashlar blocks, particularly for the aqueducts, but also for the stone coping along the, um, along the walkway beside the canal, uh, throughout the construction of this particular transport network. So, this is, so we've been able to start putting names of groups of people working on the canal. What we can't do at the moment though is to put an individual name to an individual symbol but there is some 
unstudied, unpublished documentary research that might actually allow us to do that. And that, of course, is the intersection between industrial archaeology and social history, which hopefully the 250th anniversary of the Bridgewater Canal will um, inspire further re research to do. Uh, if we go to the Runcorn terminus of the Bridgewater Canal, this is actually probably the most successful element of the whole canal system, even more so than the Castlefield Canal Basin. And the reason for that is that this provides an ocean go, a sea going link for the canal, an outlet for the coal products from the Duke's mines at Worsley, which could be exported coastally to London, which was the biggest single city in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries, and of course the biggest market for coal products. It's worth just pointing out as well that most of the coal products that came into Manchester from the 1760s onwards, from Worsley, or indeed from the mines to the east of the city, from Ashton under Lyme, or northwards uh, towards Chanderton and Rochdale, that coal was not going to fire steam engines, it was going to fire primarily people's fires. It was domestic, the use of domestic coal that prompted the Duke to build the canal in the late 1750s. Only later on with the, inter with the sort of spread of um, Bolton and Watts um, very advanced steam engine technology from the mid 1780s onwards did the market for coal expand further because of the need to power boilers to run steam engines. So it's, it's one of the quirks of this particular um, industrial archaeology relating to the Bridgewater Canal that the need for coal is a domestic need as Manchester became the biggest urban centre in the region and uh, by 1800 arguably the second largest town stroke city in uh, Britain rather than the need to supply industry with uh, a power source for the steam engines simply because the steam engines weren't there they were later on so the, Ru the Runcorn terminus is successful because it has um, more than a hundred years of continuous development exporting the coal um, outwards to uh, coastal trade to take it to London and elsewhere along the western coast so much so that they had to build not just one set of locks um, in the 1770s, but a second set of locks in the 1820s. And there were more than a dozen different um, warehouses along the dock, uh, well, the four dock fronts here at Runcorn. Sadly, most of that was demolished immediately after the Second World War. And uh, these days, what you would see will be on the left. That's the old line of locks which were recently exposed, um, <coughs> leading down to the first 1773 uh, seagoing lock itself. You can still see the 1770s um, headquarters of the Bridgewater Canal at Runcorn, which is this lovely Georgian uh, detached um, house, which we know the Duke of Bridgewater stayed at on a couple of occasions. Um, these days it's surrounded by cars, um, <laughs> In the mid-20th century, you can see it was next to um, uh, the, the, the tidal basin uh, and therefore surrounded by boats. Uh, and in fact, if you go there today, you'll find it surrounded by sixth form college students. <laughs> uh, different form of communication altogether. <laughs> We've actually only just recently started to put together the industrial archaeology of what was a very important uh, canal port and you can see the development on the right uh, the earliest map we have of this uh, is actually another um, German uh, plan this time from 1778 and then we're, we're starting to track that through in terms of the industrial archaeology and this is definitely a case where we can now only recover most of the archaeological development of this site from digging holes in the ground because the structures the superstructures the standing buildings have long since gone but you might say that this is the prototype for all other canal ports linking with river navigations and seagoing, um, seagoing trade, partly because this has the earliest flight of locks on the canal network. They were opened by 1770, 1771. There were, there were one or two along the Leeds-Liverpool, but really it's at the Runcorn uh, end of the Bridgewater Canal that we can see that the, the mass use of lines of locks and canal basins 
uh, all in a row, a concept that was picked up very rapidly and developed along the Bridgewater Canal, uh, not just on the Bridgewater Canal, but on the, on the rest of the canal network. And before I round off by looking at some parallels with the railway network, uh, you might, uh, just a word on continuing research on the Bridgewater Canal, you might think we know everything there is to know about the Bridgewater Canal. We've got records at, you know, at Salford University, Salford City Library, and we've had people researching the, the industrial archaeology of the canal since 1960, the first historical studies of the canal came out in the 1860s and the first contemporary accounts of the canal came out in the 1760s. But we can still learn new material by looking in, in detail at the physical fabric of the canal. This is the quay at Broadheath in Altrincham, which we know from documentary and map evidence was opened in 1766. The top photograph is the new Canal Warehouse, which was built in 1833 for the growing um, produce trade from the estates around Altrincham, the whole series of big landed estates like those of the uh, de Massey family, or the Earls of Stamford as they were then, who used the canal as a, a route to get their agricultural produce into Manchester. And that's the one that's generally, uh, generally pointed to at Broadheath, 1833, level of lovely classically designed um, general purpose warehouse, but it's the one below I want to point out to you, surveyed by the South Trafford Archaeology Group with a bit of prodding from me uh, last year. Um, that was originally a three-storey building. It's now a two-storey structure being used as a, as a sort of general purpose builder's warehouse. You can see the plan on the right there, long, thin, rectangular building, one gable end fronting the canal. And you can see the blocked arch, I hope, just, just over there. That's very important because what you're looking at there is a building we know was standing in 1785. It's on the map of the canal from that period. And it's actually described by Arthur Young in his description of the Bridgewater Canal uh, from 1769. If he's descri he describes the warehouse at Broad Heath, and he appears to be describing what becomes known as the old warehouse. I think that it's that structure. That would make that the oldest surviving canal warehouse in Britain. And we didn't know that until last year. And that in itself is an example of how field work in industrial archaeology, even for a very well-known monument, can reveal new information about a site or a series of sites, or indeed a transport network in this case, that we thought we knew very well. Now, just a, a word on the legacy of the Bridgewater Canal with other transport systems. In particular, I want to think about railways to round off my particular talk for this, for this morning. There is a long association of canals and railways, particularly colliery railways. Um, you, can see the, you can see the railway network for the northwest of England on the right there. That's how it uh, developed by the end of the 19th century. And most of that... Um, is away from the canal network, so a new type of transport network going in new uh, directions. But on the left is the transshipment shed at the Bugsworth Canal Basin on the Peak Forest Canal at Whaley Bridge, dating from about 1800. This is where the railway and the canal meet, and this is by no means unique. You've got an internal uh, canal warehouse with the canal arm filled there, and on the other side you can see you've got um, carriageways flanking that internal canal arm and railways for horse-drawn wagons would go in and the limestone, because this is uh, the um, Peak Forest Canal was part of the transportation system to the Dove Quarries in northwest Derbyshire bringing limestone to Manchester. The limestone would be uh, put into, um, put into car, uh, carriages on the railway, the, ra the wagons would be drawn by horses, they'd be taken to Bugsworth Basin and then transferred to the canal boats. So the link between canals and railways goes back a long way. Um, so it would come as no surprise that a lot of the industrial architecture ideas along the railway network can be seen along the canal network. And just as with turnpikes and then later on the canals, there was a huge period of expansion in a very short, period, uh, very short time, particularly in the 1840s and 1850s. And from, um, in 1838, there were only 500 miles of railways in Britain. By 1912, there were 16,000 miles. 
But the key figure, I think, is, is that from um, eight, uh, between 1849, 6,000 miles, and 1875, nearly 12,000. It's that middle period in the Victorian era <coughs> when the railway system really uh, booms. And in order for it to do that, it needs several things. It, it drew on existing architectural designs and technologies for its own warehouses. This is the 1830 railway warehouse at Liverpool Road Station, a curved multi-storey warehouse uh, facing the, um, the viaduct for the railway and using split level loading and unloading techniques. There were little turntables in front of each of the white doors you can see on the right there, which took individual carriages into the railway warehouse in the same manner that canal boats would go inside the classic canal warehouse. So that, that idea of multi-storey um, split level loading and unloading from the canal system we see developed in Castlefield, we also see being picked up by the railway network. And the 1830 warehouse at Liverpool Road, although it's the first early surviving warehouse, railway warehouse in Britain, in an urban area, it's not by any means unique in terms of the way goods are handled. So it provides a bridge between the Bridgewater and the canal system and the later railway system. And of course there are other elements of the canal system which provide the engineering um, inspiration for the railway network. Um, you can see here the Box Hill Tunnel on the Great Western Railway near Bath, the Olive Mount cutting near Liverpool and the very one of, one of two of the five railway viaducts through Castlefield in Manchester. Uh, viaducts inspired by aqueducts, cuttings where well, we see those in turnpikes and canals and tunnels we see those in particular on the canal system. All of that is engineering technology which has been um, developed by the canal system and indeed by, um, by uh, along the Bridgewater Canal network. There's another social side to that of course which is the actual workforce needed to build this network and you'll see from the way the canal building and the early railway building overlap there is a continuity of that workforce as well we know them as the navvies and they're still a, a greatly under researched part of the uh, building of transport networks uh, indeed into the early 20th century and it's, it's only now that we're starting to look at the um, the archaeology of the navvy and particularly navvy camps themselves so where does that leave us with the Duke of Bridgewater and the Bridgewater Canal? Well, I think having celebrated the 250th anniversary of the opening of the Bridgewater Canal, I think we're in a position to look at a research strategy for the canal and indeed for linear transport systems, uh, other linear canal transport systems. Some of those research points are listed here, everything from uh, you know, the canal as a machine the t with its technological innovation and parallels, and I've looked at some of those this morning. The transportation of goods, people and ideas. We could even say the communication of people and ideas. <coughs> its wider landscape impact is, is grossly under-researched. Incredibly, the business history of the canal is not as well understood as it should be. And its later development in the later 19th and into the 20th century, its physical development in particular, uh, has hardly been studied. And in terms of understanding the termini along the canal, Worsley, Castlefield and Runcorn, um, it's really only Castlefield where we have an extensive knowledge. So here we have a transportation system with its, lit, with its origins, its roots amongst the turnpike uh, developments of the late 17th and early 18th centuries and which bequeaths an engineering legacy, one could even say a, a social leg legacy in terms of the navvies, to the railway age and the future building of transport networks, so I'm thinking here of um, even down to the uh, motorways in the mid 20th century. And yet, although we know, think we know the Bridgewater Canal very well archaeologically, there's, uh, there are six research points there that um, still need further clarification. So I, I look forward to uh, a period of research bringing to light new things about the Bridgewater Canal and placing it back firmly in the consciousness as a, an important part of our transport and communications development in industrial Britain. Thank you. <laughs>